Oh, you're okay. I thought it was. I'm sorry, Oliver.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Peg Pigeon. Pigeon. It's Pigeon. Welcome to Worship with the Community of the First Unitarian Church of Omaha. A special welcome to visitors. This congregation is a community of all ages and abilities. It is a community with a rainbow of gender and sexual identities. It is a community of diverse cultural and class backgrounds. We draw from many sources of inspiration and share common liberal religious values. If you are joining us online, I encourage you to create a YouTube account and sign into it when you attend online. This will give you access to the comment feature in YouTube. You can use comments to share joys and concerns that will be lifted up in worship to say hello to other online attendees or to share something about how the service is connected with you. Those in the sanctuary are invited to, after the service to go down to the common room for coffee or tea after worship. Or you can take a to-go cup and go out into the church garden for fellowship outdoors. However you are attending worship, we encourage you to check out upcoming events around the church. Online, you go to the website, firstuuomaha.org, and under the tab, Engage, for an up-to-date list. And you volunteers are needed for the heart and hand op auction. Everyone, we were having it in person for the first time in a long time. So please, we need more volunteers for the heart and hand auction. Our choir rehearsals resume on Wednesday night, starting September 7th. All voice parts are welcome. Each week, we acknowledge that we meet for worship as the First Unitarian Church of Omaha, the land of the Omaha Odo Nations, and that indigenous people in the greater community have become marginalized and made invisible. May we recognize their presence among us and work with them to resolve the issues of poverty, displaced children, murdered and missing indigenous women, the MMIW. I wanted to note that we have a guest pianist. His name is Brian Stanley, so be sure and welcome him after church. I'm going to introduce you to Mary Kay Peters, who's our speaker, but I know 90% of you already know her, but this is for the few that don't. Um, before Mary Kay even joined First Unitarian, she was a longtime member of the First UU's Religious Studies Group, that women's group that meets on Thursday afternoons. She's been the leader in the CUPS group in charge of stewardship fundraising and is now a leader in the worship team. As Mary Kay will be reading from the writings of Dr. Margaret Jacobs today, who is unable to come today and talk about her book, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Dr. Jacobs. Dr. Margaret Jacobs is the Charles Mock Professor of History and the Director for the Center of Great Plains Studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She is of settler background and collaborates with the Rosebud Lakota journalist Kevin Aberzak on Reconciliation Rising a multimedia project that showcases the lives and works of indigenous and settlers who are working together to honestly confront painful and traumatic histories, promote meaningful and respectful dialogue between natives and non-natives, and create pathways to reconciliation. Through Reconciliation Rising, Kevin and Margaret have produced a podcast and an 11-minute film, Return of the Pawnees. They are working on an hour-long documentary, The Land Returns. Dr. Jake's, Jacobs is also the co-director and co-founder of the Genua, Genua Indian School Digital Reconciliation Project at UNL. This project locates and makes available all government records regarding the Genoa School as an act of archival reconciliation of bringing history home to tribal nations. 
Dr. Jacobs has published 35 articles and four books, primarily about the U.S. government's policy and practice of indigenous child removal and family separation over a century. Her recently published book, After 100 Winters, In Search of Reconciliation on America's Stolen Lands, was published by Princeton University Press in 2021. Mary Kay. Good morning. So um, today we're going to ask Bruce Godfrey to come up and light the chalice for us. Happy to see Bruce. Haven't seen him in a while. <laughs> Spark of the spirit, cupped in earth's embrace, light of love, alive in all creation. As we kindle this flame, we rekindle our connection to the sacred web of life. Thank you. And now Brian is going to play a Bach piece for us for the opening. Thanks, Brian, that was really lovely. And now I'm gonna actually read the story for all ages today. We have a really special story. So I wanna invite all those who might be here in the sanctuary that would like to come forward, children of young, young at heart, and people of all ages who would like to come forward for the story. Okay, and we got some lovely slides, too, along with the book. Okay, so the name of our book today is Stolen Words. How are you guys this morning? Good. Good to see ya. Now, the author says that she wrote this book for her grandfather, who was of Cree descendancy. Uh, her name is Melanie Florence. And she, do you? Wow, small world. So she wished that she had been able to share an experience like this with her grandfather when he was alive. She wasn't able to, but she wrote this story instead. She came home from school today, skipping and dancing. Can you guys see the pictures? Clutching a dream catcher she had made from odds and ends. Bits of string, plastic beads, and brightly colored feathers. 
Her glossy braids danced against her shoulders, swaying with her black as a raven's wing. A picture of her with her beautiful glossy braids. Grandpa, she asked, clutching his hand, spinning under his arm before dropping it again. How do you say grandfather in Cree? He stopped breathing for a moment, a lifetime to a seven-year-old. He looked down at her sadly. I don't remember, he answered. I lost my words a long time ago. A frown clouded her face. How do you lose your words, Grandpa, she asked. They took them away, he answered. She thought for a moment. Where did they take them, she asked. Anyways, <laughs> we're having slight difficulties with the slides. Where they took all of us, he said, away from home, away from laughter and soft words, away from our mothers who cried for us. She reached for his gnarled hand. Who took you away, Grandpa, she asked quietly. Men and women dressed in black. Talking to us with words we did not know, he answered. They reached home and sat on the stairs together. Where did they take you, Grandpa, she asked. Away to a school that was cold and lonely, where angry white faces raised their voices and their hands. When we used our words, he answered. They took our words and locked them away, punished us until we forgot them, until we sounded like them. Harsh, sharp words, so different from the sound of our beautiful ones. She touched his weathered face, tried to wipe the sadness away with her soft hands. She looked down at her lap and handed him the dream catcher that she had made for her room. You take this, Grandpa, she said. Maybe it will help you find your words again. He smiled at her, his granddaughter, and touched her innocent face, a face that had never known hard words or raised hands. He smiled and kissed her head. The next day, she skipped out of school again, smiling wildly at her grandfather. She stopped in front of him and took a deep breath. Tanisi, nimosom, she said. His eyes widened. She smiled brighter than the sun. I found your words, Grandpa, she said. She pulled a tattered, well-worn paperback out of her book bag. Introduction to Cree, it said. My teacher helped me find this book for you at the library. He reached for it, his hands shaking, opened it, feeling the soft, much-loved pages under his fingers. No sisim, he whispered, granddaughter. The word felt familiar in his mouth. 
it felt like his home, his mother. He turned the pages of the book carefully. Masenaki, Masenahikan, book. He turned another, word after word. Pikiske Wawina, his words, pages and pages of them. He looked at his granddaughter, his no see seem. Thank you, Taniki, he said. Will you read to me, she asked, taking his hand in hers and leading him home. Will you teach me your words? His heart danced as he nodded, holding the book against his chest. The end. Yay. <laughs> Great somersault. And now it's time for our community offering. Our Share the Plate recipient for September is Planned Parenthood. We encourage you to learn more about Planned Parenthood if you aren't familiar with the organization. Um, and you can visit their website. And you can also um, directly donate funds there. And otherwise, we share the loose change in our collection plate during the month of September with Planned Parenthood. for our joys and concerns. Um, we haven't received any by email. Did any yellow cards get filled out with any joys and concerns? Uh, Colin, are there any on YouTube? Not at this time, no. Not at this time? Everything's great in the world? Okay. All right. We're going to move on to our little short meditation. So we're going to start by just settling back in our chairs. If you prefer to close your eyes in order to kind of shut out other stimulation, I'm actually going to read during this time a prayer of reconciliation. It's by Ann Barker. 
So if you're settled in with both feet firmly on the floor, your back is straight, but it is not stiff, we'll begin. We gather with a hunger for reconciliation. What is done cannot be undone. What is done next, now, be done with care. We gather because we are hopeful, because we have visions and dreams of a brighter future, that there be more than vision in this room. These are the wounds we must heal together. Grief and anger for all that has been lost. Guilt or fear in the reliving. Pain that is gone without sufficient comfort. Mistrust that was earned that continues burning still. Every injury we may have named and yet still carry. Those we haven't, can't, or dare not speak aloud. Those we are not ready to make public. Those still not recognized, accepted, understood. These are the wounds that seek replacement, not cancellation or denial. Wounds we tend cautiously, applying the salve of understanding, forming scars that mark our history without disfiguring the future we might share. This is not a time of quick solutions, fancy talking. This is slow precision. This is a prayer for peace. And now we're going to move on as we open our eyes. Mary Kay is going to give the first part of her talk. I don't know about all of you, but since the January 6th insurrection, I've pretty regularly been reading uh, a lot of the current current event summaries mixed with historical essays from popular American historian Heather Cox Richardson. <laughs> I see some other people have been re reading them too. Uh, she's easy to read and understand, and I love the way that she pulls together um, U.S. history into comparisons with modern day events. So we actually have our own local historian that um, I came upon this past summer when I attended, let's see, it was a summer program by put together by the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, Summer of Reckoning and Reconciliation. And Dr. Margaret Jacobs was one of the speakers in July, and she is the director of the uh, Center for Great Plains Studies. And I think she writes very eloquently, and so I asked her if she would come speak here. She couldn't make it, but she very kindly gave me permission to read from her new book, After 100 Winters in Search of Reconciliation in America's Stolen Lands. So we're gonna get through this story. It's the story of the Ponca tribe of Nebraska and the Trail of Tears. The, it's gonna be divided into like part one, part two, which is more current events with a little piano interlude mixed in the middle so we can kind of separate my speaking. And I ask all of you gentle listeners to bear with me as we get through this story. Some of you might know some of the main points of Standing Bear, especially being from Omaha and the landmark civil rights case, but we're gonna fill in the picture with all kinds of details that most people never knew about. So Margaret recently introduced me to the term settler colonialism. The ob objective of settler colonialism is always the acquisition of indigenous land territories and resources. 
It involved the acquiring of millions upon millions of acres in Australia, Canada, and North America, from the hands of native indigenous peoples to those of the European colonizers. It was indeed a shockingly fast and nearly thorough change of both land ownership slash stewardship and status of indigenous peoples in the 1800s, mostly, in these territories. And one such story that hits particularly close to home today is the story of the Ponca tribe. Ponca had been a small tribal nation. By the 1870s, they numbered just about 700. In the early 1800s, they lived for most of each year in a village where the Niobrara River meets the Missouri River. There in the fertile river bottom, the Poncas grew the three sisters, squash, beans, and corn, as well as tobacco. Each summer, most tribal members journeyed out onto the vast surrounding grassy plains for the annual buffalo hunt. They returned to their home base each August or September to harvest and preserve their crops for the winters ahead. Even today, from a high bluff in Niobrara State Park, the tall grass can be seen willowing around in the early summer, and you can face north and track the Missouri River as it might have looked 100 years ago before Lewis and Clark rode up its waters. You can then face to the south and see the sandbars of the broad Niobrara River, where lots of people like to go inner tubing <laughs> in the summers. You can see why other tribes, the American government, and settlers all coveted this land, the beautiful country. You can understand why the Poncas loved this place so much and resisted attempts by all these other invaders to wrest it away from them. And so to stay in their homelands, in 1858, the Poncas negotiated their third treaty with the US government that secured for them a small reservation, about 58,000 acres on the Niobrara River in exchange for ceding the rest of their land, and that's an estimated 2,334,000 acres to the US government. They thought that with this concession, they could finally live undisturbed in peace, but it was not to be so. Just 10 years later, in the Fort Laramie Treaty, the US government created the Great Sioux Reservation and mistakenly included the Ponca's land in the territory newly assigned to the Lakota Sioux. This opened them up to raids and attacks from the Brule Sioux. The government's solution to this fiasco was a proposal to move the Ponca tribe in 1876 to Indian Territory in present-day Oklahoma. The Ponca tribe sent 10 representatives, including Standing Bear, whose tribal name was Machu Naza, with a US agent to evaluate the land and its prospects. The tribal representatives took one look at the arid land, found that it was uninhabitable, and voted no. <laughs> they weren't going to go, regardless. The Poncas were forced the following year by the US Army at Bayonet Point to walk to the Indian Territory in what has now become known as the Ponca Trail of Tears. The trail runs from Niobrara, Nebraska, south through Kansas, and into Oklahoma. 
Storms pummeled them almost daily, and many died on the long walk. When the tribe finally arrived in Indian territory, after 55 days, the government had not made any provisions for their new home. They arrived in the middle of a blazing hot summer in 1878, too late to plant any crops, and so they faced starvation. Since the tribe had left Nebraska, somewhere between one quarter to one third of the population had either died along the trail or succumbed to disease and starvation in Oklahoma. Standing Bear's own 16-year-old son died in late December of 1878. Wanting to honor his son's last wish to be buried in the land of his birth and not in a strange country where his spirit would wander forever, Standing Bear left Oklahoma with somewhere between 30 to 60 other tribal members carrying the bones of his son to be buried in the familiar earth along the Niobrara River. They set out on foot in January, once again on the trail through the Great Plains winter, begging for food along the way, reaching the reservation of their relatives, the Omaha tribe, about two months later. It was here that they were arrested on orders of the Secretary of the Interior and were held by General George Crook at Fort Omaha. A delay was obtained by the Army and General Crook so that they could rest and regain their health. And during this time, their story was told to the public by journalist Thomas Tibbles an editor with a local Omaha paper and an ally for the tribe. This led to some pro bono legal services being obtained for Chief Standing Bear and the Poncas by two prominent defense attorneys in Omaha, one of whom later became counsel for the UP Railroad. Standing Bear and his allies petitioned the U.S. District Court in Omaha for the Ponca's release and their right to return to their Nebraska homeland. Government prosecutors responded that under federal law at that time, Native Americans were not considered persons or citizens, and therefore, therefore they were not eligible to seek a writ of habeas corpus under Article 14 of the Constitution of the United States. Standing Bear's eloquence with Suzette LaFleche acting as Ponca interpreter for him in the court won their freedom in the landmark civil rights case, Standing Bear versus Crook. 1879, and I quote, my hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, I shall feel pain. If you pierce your hand, you also feel pain. The blood that will flow from mine will be the same color as yours. The same God made us both. I am a man. Judge Elmer Dundee ruled, an Indian is a person within the meaning of the law, and there is no law giving the army authority to forcibly remove the Indians from their lands. The government arranged for lands along the Niobrara River to be allotted to Standing Bear and the tribal members, accompanying him back to the Ponca homeland from Oklahoma. But at this point, the tribe was left divided now into northern and southern branches, to this day, in Nebraska and Oklahoma. Now we're going to take 
a few minutes to listen to a piano interlude from Brian. Thanks, Brian. Um, I just want to take a moment to say that that song, Everything in Its Right Place, written by Tom York, and I got permission for um, performing, for Brian to perform a special arrangement of that piece from Sequoia Sounds with the sheet music. So I just want to say thank you if you're out there watching. And also, once again, many thanks to Margaret Jacobs for allowing me to read from this new book. So now we're gonna jump ahead to more current times. It's a typical summer day in Nebraska on June 10th, 2018. Hot, humid, and hazy, an insistent wind blows the heat around like a confection oven. We're on a farm. Yes, there will be corn. The farmers Art and Helen Tanderup are white and in their 60s. Art is portly, a bit aloof and gruff. Helen exudes both stand by your man farm wife and tough as nails, take no crap, rural woman. 
This farm has been in Helen's family ever since the late 19th century, pioneering days. If you're imagining a two-story clapboard farmhouse, circa 1900, with a big porch, surrounded by a tangle of rose bushes, dignified old shade trees, and a generous circle of grass. You'd be right. Art is preparing to plant corn in his field near Neely in the north central area of Nebraska. Helen is working in the kitchen, but the tractor remains in the barn and the big sacks of field corn, the kernels all the same homogeneous size and the same weak yellow color, sit unopened in the utility shed. Art won't be planting those today. Instead, about 100 people are slowly gathering to help Art sow something else on his land by hand. They come bearing small beaded bags of seeds. Poured out in your palm, they're dusty blue, pomegranate red, with some cream and butter colors thrown in. These sowers have brought also tubs of potato salad and coleslaw, hefty watermelons, and still warm pies. And many are pitching in to help, to help Helen serve the large crowd. Perhaps you think it's a neighborly barn raising, a return to the homesteading era. Maybe you feel a little nostalgic just thinking about it, or uh, if you're possibly from a farm family, or if your childhood diet of pop culture was filled with such scenes like mine was. But this is in a reunion of farm families. Many of the visitors are from the Ponca tribe that were separated into northern and southern branches for over 135 years. Other local tribal members participated in the gathering too. Omaha's, Winnebago's, and Santee Sioux. They tumble out of their trucks, laughing in shorts, in jeans, and wearing flip-flops. Some of the women dress in handmade calico skirts ringed with ribbons. There are non-Indians also in their baseball caps and their cargo shorts, their Birkenstocks and their sneakers. Kids turn cartwheels in the grass. Their grandparents lounge in the folding chairs near the big utility shed where the food will be served. It's clear from the hugs and the smiles, the comfortable ease, that many of these people have known one another for a while. Indeed, these modern and ancient corn planters had originally come together in 2013 to oppose a transnational oil pipeline, the Keystone XL, that would bisect the Tanderup's farm and the homelands of the Poncas. These strangers didn't know each other at the time, but they shared a common concern that a pipeline spill would contaminate the water, quietly flowing underground in the Ogallala Aquifer. They feared the poisoned water would disperse for hundreds of miles. Slowly, the strangers became political allies, and then the political alliances grew into personal friendships. At a shared spirit camp, TP, that fall, Makasi Horanek from the Ponca tribe of Oklahoma tells how his people lost the sacred seed and the corn when they were removed to Oklahoma. And it would be great to bring it back and have it back in its homeland. Makasi and another gentleman then proceeded to search for and actually found a medicine bundle that held the remains of a corn crop that the Lakota Sioux had harvested in the fall of 1877 when the Poncas had been removed. After more than 100 winters, that handful of red sacred corn delighted everyone when little corn seedlings pushed out of the spring soil and began to climb toward the sun. We had a beautiful crop of corn that year, Art remembers, 
And ever since then, the Pankas converged on the Tandarup's family farm twice a year, first in the early summer to plant, and then in the fall to harvest the corn. But the fifth year of corn planting at the Tandarup farm is special. Before the planting begins, a ceremony is held. Four VIPs sit in front of a large table covered with a bison robe. Art Tanderup sits at one end. Larry Wright Jr., chairman of the Ponca tribe of Nebraska, sits at the other end. Helen nestles cozily between her husband and Casey Camp Horanek who is councilwoman of the Southern Ponca tribe of Oklahoma, and she's also Makasi's mother. Almost exactly 160 years ago, Ponca chiefs had signed over millions of acres of their homelands to the US government, later to be redistributed as homesteads to people like Helen Tanderup's family. Today, on this topsy-turvy farm, instead of the Ponkas giving up more of their land, Art and Helen Tanderup are signing a different kind of treaty, a deed that returns the Ponkas one acre corn plot to them. And later, the Tanderup's gift expanded to 10 acres of land, repatriated to the tribe. During the ceremony, Art talks about how the return of land grew out of facing the Ponca's history together at the spirit camp. Art acknowledges that it can never make what went wrong right, but it can show how we feel about this and how we are honored to give this small piece of land back to the people that were stewards of this land. They took care of it. They knew how to take care of it. After he speaks, Art signs the deed to transfer the land to the Pankas and then passes it to Helen, who quietly and decisively adds her signature. Casey and Larry wipe tears from their eyes. Casey composes herself and says, this day, our mother, the earth, sustained us and gave us reason to live. This day, the wind is blessing us, allowing us to become one in spirit. Casey then signs the deed to great applause. She hands it to Larry to sign. Larry tells of how pleased he is to be able to sit here as partners, to come together out of the goodness of your heart and undo what the federal government did by separating the Ponca people into two different groups. But Art and his family have brought us back together to unite us with this land. Larry adds that the Ponca tribe of Nebraska is buying 1,800 acres of land near Niobrara, and one day we'll plant Ponca corn there too. The Poncas then honor Art and Helen by draping Pendleton blankets woven with colorful geometric patterns over their shoulders. It's not often that settlers learn about the specific piece of land they occupy of how indigenous people were dispossessed and displaced from it. The Tanderups came to know the truth of the place, where they had settled, as we all have learned it now. The Poncas gently offered this truth to us as a kind of gift. To American Indians, an equally significant story to their historic plight is this. We endured, we are still here, we survived. And even more than that, we are reviving our life ways and we will thrive. Reckoning with the past is not to be feared or avoided. 
It is a path to living more fully and responsibly, not just to survive, but to revive and thrive. It's even more unusual for settlers to take some responsibility for this truth of land dispossession, and rarer still to take action to make amends for it. The Tandarups are uncommon settlers, indeed. They went from political allies to working with the Pankas to plant their sacred seeds and repatriating some of the land in an act of accountability and personal atonement. I don't tell you this story to lionize the Tandarups as white saviors who took pity on the Pankas and gave them a small donation of land. I'm relating what the Tandarups did because they show us what can happen when settlers and indigenous people face their painful truths together, plant new seeds of friendship, uncover paths to reconciliation and redress, and imagine new futures. And that's it. So we have some closing words as Peg extinguishes the chalice. May we all understand just how much we have to gain by confronting and learning about our history and not running away from it. Because by practicing reconciliation, we co-create a new world, a world in which we extend ourselves out to those around us. May we not shrink away from one another in fear. May we thrive in our interconnectedness. May it be so. And I actually have one important announcement before we do our closing hymn. On September 25th, everyone save the date, either to be here or virtually. There's going to be a special congregational meeting on reproductive justice. Your board of trustees is beginning the process that, per our bylaws, would enable the congregation to take a public stand on reproductive justice, including abortion access. It starts with a special congregational meeting and then, if greenlit, a membership vote by mailed ballot. And I believe that this congregational meeting will be after that service on September 25th. So now we're gonna all together sing Wo Yaya, it's hymn 1020. And Peg and I will kind of lead everybody.
convince everyone. I've told my coworkers at work, we are not a kumbaya singing crowd. We are a wo ya ya <laughs> crowd here. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs>